Once more, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Our debate tonight is on the establishment of war crime court in Liberia. And uh, with me is my co-host, Daniel Knuckles. And we have our guest who is against the establishment of war crime court in Liberia, Mr. Vasiki Conan. We want to say that uh, an invitation, we were, we were expecting Mr. Benang Goa to speak for the establishment of war crime court in Liberia, but at the 11th hour, he told us that he was having some technical difficulty and couldn't be on the show. But uh, we have the Coalition for Justice and, uh, and all those that have been calling for the, establish, the establishment of war crime court in Liberia. They are, we hope they are on the line to give their input. Ever since the Liberian War uh, ceased, we have had things about the establishment of war crime court. We have heard about the uh, implementation of the TROC recommendations. And in light of that, we thought that uh, we should have a live debate. So FOL has started a new series called Opposing Views. And number one on the Opposing Views, where we'll have pro and cons for the topics that we're going to select. Number one topic is the establishment of the war crime court in Liberia. And I call on my co-host, Danielle, to uh, introduce our guest. Good evening, everyone. So tonight we have Mr. Kona. He can correct me on his first name. How do you say that? Vasiki. Vasiki? Vasiki. Vasiki Kona. Vasiki Kona. Um, Mr. Kona is a Liberian writer, award-winning poet, magazine publisher, and community and cultural activist whose works have been widely published in Liberian newspapers and on websites based in Liberia, the U.S., and Europe. He has authored three books, with the most recent being The Land of My Father's Birth, Memoir of the Liberian Civil War. He immigrated to the U.S. in 1995 and enlisted in the U.S. Navy in August of 1996. He served for nine years from 1996 to 2005. He is also the founding chairman of the National Civil Rights Movement, NCRM, a Philadelphia-based Liberian pro-democracy and human rights organization. He is currently serving as the Director for Cultural Outreach for an organization called Sewa. Sewa in Gio or Don language means for the same of my country. Sewa promotes cultural diversity, campaigns against gender-based violence, sustainable agricultural programs, and education in Liberia. So uh, welcome, Mr. Kona, and thanks for being here with us this evening. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak on this very important issue of our time. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I know I've been here before. Uh, it is always a pleasure to join this program to at least share my view on burning issue of the day. Uh, in our current Liberian conversation, I don't think there is any issue that is so debated compared to whether we should have war crime trial or we should have uh, genuine reconciliation among Liberia. I know today, given all the popular support for war crime, my position may not be the most popular position among Liberians, but I have chosen to focus on reconciliation or consider that to be the best option as a matter of principle. And I, I'm not going to shy away from discussing that in any forum, either here in diaspora or in Liberia. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Conan. Welcome back. Um, so, as you said, this has become a hot issue, a hot topic within the Liberian community, both in Liberia and in the diaspora. And so before we start tonight, we just want to educate our viewers on what the International Criminal Court, or ICC, is, and, and also revisit some of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, so to start, uh, the International Criminal Court 
investigates and where warranted tries individuals charged with the gravest crimes of concern to the international community. And that's genocide, war crimes, wars, war against humanity, and the crime of aggression. Through international criminal justice, the court aims to hold those responsible accountable for their crimes and to help prevent these crimes from happening again. Governed by an international treaty called the Rome Statute, the ICC is the world's first permanent international criminal court. The ICC began functioning on the 1st of July, 2002 the date that the Rome Statute entered into force. The Rome Statute is a multilateral treaty which serves as the ICC's foundational and governing document. States which become party to the Rome Statute, for example, by ratifying it, became member states, excuse me, become member states of the ICC. Currently, there are 123 states which are party to the Rome Statute and therefore members of the ICC. So there are 33 African countries that are included in those 123 states. Um, and this does include Liberia and its neighbors, the Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Cote d'Ivoire. And so just to recap, the ICC jurisdiction is over four main crimes. That's genocide. Crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. So the crime of genocide is characterized by the specific intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, or racial, or religious group by killing its members or by other means, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. The ICC can prosecute crimes against humanity, which are serious violations committed as part of a large-scale attack against any civilian population. The 15 or some of the 15 forms of crimes against humanity listed in the Rome Statute include offenses such as murder, rape, imprisonment, enforced disappearances, and enslavement particularly of women and children, um, sexual slavery, torture, apartheid, and deportation. War crimes, which are grave breaches of the G Geneva Conventions in the context of armed conflict, and include, for instance, the use of child soldiers, the killing or torture of persons such as civilians or prisoners of war intentionally directing attacks against hospitals, historic monuments, or buildings dedicated to religion, education, art, science, or charitable purposes. And the crime of aggression is the use of armed forces by a state against the sovereignty, integrity, or independence of another state. So just to recap, the ICC began functioning in 2002. There are 123 states um, that have agreed to the Rome Statute, and that does include Liberia and its neighbors. And they have jurisdiction over four main crimes, and that's genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. To go... Further, we know that um, Liberia had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. At the close of the commission, there were several recommendations that were offered up. So I'm just going to read some of the recommendations that are specific to the war crimes. So the Liberia Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommended the following to the commission, that those who died, well, one, that those who died as a result of the conflict be memorialized 
by monuments and multi-purpose halls erected in the name of victims at all sites of massacre. Another recommendation is that individual reparations be granted to the victims of Liberia's civil crisis in the form of psychosocial support, uh, educational scholarships, microloans, livestock support, agriculture support, and food aid. They've also recommended that community reparations be granted to affected populations in the form of centers for psychosocial support, support to communal farming, and priority rehabilitation of roads, schools, and health facilities. It's also recommended that perpetrators should provide financial or in-time contributions for reparations to buttress reparations programs at the community level. It's also recommended that there be prosecutions for all perpetrators in positions of leadership during the conflict, including heads of warring factions, frontline commanders, and those who committed economic crimes and supported them, who are accused of violating international humanitarian and human rights laws or crimes against humanity and have not acknowledged their wrongs or appeared before the TRC. It's also recommended that a court of competent jurisdiction be established in Liberia to deal with these cases immediately upon submission of the TRC's final report. It also states that no blanket amnesties be granted, but that upon accounting for their deeds, persons can qualify for amnesty if they were, one, below the age of 18 when acting as fighters, two, did not violate international humanitarian and human rights laws or crimes, against humanity and cooperated with the TRC and spoke the truth and were remorseful. Also, that perpetrators who committed crimes against humanity should not be elected or appointed to public office. So those were recommendations to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, Thanks for them to follow up on at the close of the report. Have those recommendations. They're asking for a memorial at all of the massacre sites to memorialize the victims. They're also asking for support for individuals who suffered during the war, which is social support and uh, microloans and other things to help these people to recuperate from the effects of the war. Um, they've also asked for prosecution of leaders of the war, leaders of war and faction, um, and anyone who committed um, economic crime. Um, and it also stated that perpetrators should not be allowed to be elected into public office. And then finally, um, as it relates to the war crimes court uh, discussion, The TRC also called on the Liberian people. This is um, a motion to them encouraging to encourage and take part in reconciliation practices at all levels and to support to their greatest ability the implementation of these recommendations. And to two pressure leaders at the community, county, and national level to remain seized of the matter of these recommendations. And three, finally, establish civil society monitoring bodies comprised of members from different, um, from different pressure groups, community advocacy groups, and traditional leaders to track and advocate for the implementation of the, uh, of the recommendation. So, the final portion of the TRC report is just asking and calling on Liberians to encourage um, our leaders to follow up with all the recommendations of the TRC report. So that's it.
Thank you so much, uh, my uh, co-host. Again, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is our segment on opposing viewpoints. Our topic tonight is on the establishment of war crimes court in Liberia. Mr. Vasiki Kone is representing those who are against the establishment of a war crime court in Liberia. We don't have a representative. The representative we have for the establishment of war crime court was not able to appear. So we go right to uh, Mr. Kone. Mr. Kone, please tell us and our viewing audience why you do not support the establishment of a war crime court in Liberia. Well, uh, thank you. And I'll be very happy to say something to the contrary of the war crime, you know, trial campaign. Um, if you can remember, during the TRC process, as far as calling for war crime trial, it was not something that all of the TRC members agreed to. Some said no to it, some signed it. And I think if I can remember, among those that went against calling for war crime trial was my late uncle, Sheikh Akumba Kone. Uh, he and other colleagues on the uh, commission believed at the time that the best way forward for Liberia is for us to reconcile our differences through community dialogue among various groups that participated in the war. Uh, I know there are four main groups that participated in the war, uh, which are the Crime, Mandingo, the Gio, the Mano. Uh, they constituted a major portion of the war, those that participated in the war. And, of course, they will give different reasons why they were targeted or they participated in the war. All right? So, and we can see, too, that when the war started, it was something that all Liberian people supported. And here's the genesis. President Samuel Doe came to power in 1980. And, of course, the military was supposed to rule for five years and turn over to the civilian. Mr. Doe wanted to perpetuate himself into power. He remained in power until 1985 elections happened. And, of course, many people believed that Mr. Tim, I mean, Mr. Doe did not win the election, that he rigged the election in his favor, saying he was the sitting head of state at the time. All right. We all remember, after the war, we had, I mean, after the election in 1985, we had the 1985 November 12th invasion led by the former commanding general of the Armed Forces of Liberia, General Thomas Duku Ongba. Okay, and the aftermath of that coup, that failed coup, led to so many repressed killings by the government soldiers loyal to President Doe. And of course, when all of these events took place, many people thought that the best thing to do is to fight a war against Samuel Doe. And of course, Taylor capitalized on the popular sentiment of the Liberian people and launched the war on December 24, 1989. And, of course, I can say when the war started in Nimba County, the NPFL soldiers or the NPFL fighters were on the rampage looking for the crowns and the mandingos. Many Liberians at that point didn't really, really care, you know, what was happening to the Crown people, what was happening to the Mandingo people. As far as they were concerned, the war was a necessary thing to do. We all have to understand that war is not a tea party. You're not calling people to come and share biscuit or to share drink. You know the war has a consequence, which is death. So if the war started and it was like a popular movement among Liberian people, you know, it, it, it got the popular backing of the people. So the war that was prosecuted in that case there, and of course, um, those that were accused of being Samuel Doe's, I mean, President Doe's supporter, they too had to come back to defend themselves. 
in, 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 in the situation. So as such, for any one of us to say today that let's persecute this group or that group, to me it's not in place because we had a situation where one group heroes is another group villain. You know, if you have a war fought on ethnic and religious level, of course, it's difficult to have a consensus opinion as to who is guilty and who is not guilty. A lot of times, our people want to compare us to Sierra Leone. But the difference between Sierra Leone and Liberia is that the war in Sierra Leone was not influenced by ethnicity or religion like ours in Liberia. There are certain tribes that felt that they were being targeted. They had no option but to come back and defend themselves. If you ask the Crown people, they're going to say the same thing. If you ask the Mandingo people, they're going to say the same thing. The old people will say, we were targeted for, I mean, by, by, we were targeted by the government and we had no other option but to defend ourselves. All right? And when it comes to, I know I'm a former military person, I do understand that there is a protocol, there is a rule of war when it comes to prosecution of war. But what happened here? When you have a war, even among professional military people, of course, there can be collateral damages. You know, that could be buildings, that could be materials, that could be humor. All right? But now what we had in Liberia is that we had young people, some of whom were very young, to even understand the reason they were fighting for. And these young people from different, different group of, uh, group of community were fighting out of sentiment. They, they were not professional soldiers. So if we can expect collateral damage in the professional military situation, what about uneducated, untrained, young civilian brought into war scenario, what do you expect? So what I'm trying to say now is that if the war was a popular movement among Liberian people, we supported it. We didn't care who was being killed in Nima County. We didn't care who was being killed in Bon County. We didn't care who was being killed in different parts of Liberia. People were in Monrovia saying that let Mr. Taylor come to Monrovia and answer me those regimes. Those that were supporting Mr. Doe, I mean, Mr. Taylor at the time, they were clamoring for him to come to Monrovia. They really didn't care about who was being killed in those rural places. So I'm saying, based on all of these factors, that all Iran people are responsible for the war. And as such, the best thing we can do is for us to dialogue among us and see why we fought this war. Go to the root causes of the war and see if we can all come to terms but the fact that, yeah, we all contributed to the calamity that befell our nation as a result of this war. And hopefully, at that point, we should be able to tell each other, normal, let's move on. You know? It means that we all have to accept our own responsibility. You know, like I asked some questions some time ago uh, to some of the people that are saying, let's have a war crime trial. I'm like, how old were you when the war started? Maybe if we, you were too young, I may escape or forgive your situation. But if you're old like me, and at some point you embraced the war, you thought it was the best solution, it was the only solution to bring about change in Liberia, if you're talking about war crime today, it's not very hypocritical to me. That's my position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Conner. So in, in other words, okay, the you, you're saying the people embraced the war initially. Yes, but, they embraced the war. But in the process, mm. you, can, you can still fight a war without listing some of the things that uh, the ICC talked about. For instance, you talk about young people being recruited. You talk about the damages and all these things. Of course, that's the reason they are calling for the war crime court because people left the army and went to kill civilians. Those atrocities that were committed are you saying there is there can be or no war without the without the uh, without the recruitment of kids 
without the atrocities, without rape and all the kind of mayhem and the atrocity we saw? Or are you saying since we supported it, whatever happened, we should just swallow it? Definitely. What I'm trying to say, if you supported the war one way or the other, and knowing very well that war is not a tea party, it's not a birthday party, war has the consequences. You should have known from the very beginning before you even went for the war. If you supported the war in any form or shape, that means whatever consequences of the war, you must also take responsibility for that. That's my position. And many Liberians today will pretend as if to say they are so innocent. They didn't support anyone, you know. But my position is we all supported some world fashion or another. And as such, the best thing we all can do is to basically let bygone be bygone. And when it comes to war crime, in most cases, war crime is the victor's justice against those who they defeated. If you look at Allah, you know, the, the, the World War II, the Allah forces, they won the war, and they, 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 they um, put together a war crime tribunal to investigate those they defeated. All right? Even if you look at Rwanda right now, which is one of the best examples that bring people want to look at, it was still a victor's justice because Paul Kigami, who is the president now, who has been celebrated by most Liberians as a good leader, he was a rebel leader. He killed people. He got the power. And under his leadership, the war crime court was instituted in Rwanda. So one word or other, one can say it's the victor's justice in that country because one of the men that led the war, that prosecuted the war, and of course he killed people and up to now, he's a dictator in that country. He is being held by many of our Liberian people to be a good leader. Yes, he's a dictator, but I mean, he can be given credit for his development initiative, his development agenda in that country, which is very, very great. But at the same time, we have to also understand that the war crime tribunal that happened in Rwanda was a victor's justice. In our case, well, we said in 1997, that we were forgiven all the war criminals, I mean, quote-unquote, war law. Everything that happened in the war, we were forgiven and moving on. And as a result, we elected Mr. Taylor to be the president of Liberia in 1997. So one can say the same way Mr. Taylor was elected as president, Paul Kigami emerged as the leader in Rwanda. If Mr. Taylor had done the right thing in Liberia, had a strong development agenda and become very much successful with development programs in Liberia, just the single part Kigami had become in, uh, in, in Rwanda, I'm not sure Liberian people would have been calling for war crime today. But Mr. Taylor's failure to bring all of us together on a one umbrella to let bargain be bargain and started meddling into the affairs of other countries, you know, and as a result of that, he is in the situation where he is in today. So if you say now let's have a world crime trial like Hassan Belete, one of the leaders of the world crime campaign said recently that it is not fair to Mr. Taylor for he alone to be in jail while other people are walking scot-free in Liberia. But the fact of the matter is we Liberian people did not reward other Liberian warlords. We rewarded Mr. Taylor with the hope that he will be able to reconcile the nation. So if he has succeeded, we shouldn't be talking about war crime today. The, the, the fact that we are talking about war crime today is because of the failure of his leadership. And if he went to jail because of that, I mean, as a result, of his meddling into other countries' affairs, I don't think it is fair for us to say today, let's have a war crime trial. Because we had the option to make that happen or not to make that happen in 1997. So if you ask question now, all the people talking about war crime trial, where were these people in 1997? Was there any organized movement among Liberian people that said, no, instead of having an election in 1907, let's make sure all of these people that participated in the war should not participate in the election process? He did not say anything like that. So when it come in like a journey come lately, talking about war crime today, so to me it's too late. And even if we should consider war crime at some point in Liberia, I think at this particular moment in time, it's not timely. Because you just had, uh, you just had, a, I mean, have a new president. We just took over a few months ago, and as we all see today, 
There's a lot of economic challenges in the country. Poverty is increasing. People are crying for, for hardship. So do you expect President Weir to, you know, to leave all this burning issue and focus on war crime trial at this particular moment? I don't think it's not, it, it, it is a timely issue. I believe that what we need to do right now is to support our government so that it can at least fund its footing in bringing about economy, you know, um, liberal, I mean, economic situation that will be favorable to the Labrador people, you know. Right now, people are crying from not being able to put food on the table for their family, not being able to send their kids to school. A young lady had to prostitute themselves to pay for their own school fee or to even feed the family. These are all burning issues to me that should be given priority at this time, more than to say let's set up a war crime trial. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Connor, a few questions for you based on your um, statement there. Um, for one, you say timing. It's not the right time. Um, President President Wea has just began and his priority should be the economy and, you know, ensuring that Liberians have their basic needs met. So I yes. guess my question to that is, if that's the case, Will we ever have a, a, a war crime court if we're talking about timing? How long will it take for us to get to um, an economically sustainable position where a majority of the population is doing well? And then, two, I believe what other people have said um, online is that this is the perfect time because President Wea has been, was not involved in the war. Um, so he is someone who should have an objective point of view. Um, he is someone who was affected by the war also in terms of his family members. Um, so that's a, another point. So timing in terms of how long should we wait because economic sustainability doesn't seem around the corner to right now we have a president whose hands are clean. You know, so he would be the perfect person to start a trial. What do you say to that? Well, uh, like I said earlier, I just don't think it's timely. You know, it, it, it is an ongoing debate. Uh, at some point, if Liberian people make the decision that it is war crime trial they are going for, hey, I could be one person that would say no to it, but of course what the majority says is what's going to happen. All right? So I think uh, one of the best ways to do this, you know, is like another election should be coming soon, uh, whether it's the senatorial election or it's another presidential election or general election. We should put in the ball on the ballot, you know, like a proposition where people will be asked after they have already selected the candidates they want, people should be asked to see whether the best option for is war crime trial or reconciliation. Through that process, we will be able to know what the people want. But what is happening right now, you have a group of people who are motivated by political interests and economic interests to carry on these war crime things as a way of eliminating their, their own potential rivals. Because if you say you are going to constitute war crime trial and so so and so person should not participate, you know, of course, to me, that's one word or other you tend to eliminate your opponent. It should be the people who desire to see what they want to do in Liberia, not just group of people that are just running around trying to get international money to fill their pocket at the expense of labor and people, peace and development. Um, good good uh, uh, idea there. So I also have been interested in understanding why exactly this has become such a hot topic recently. Um, over the last 12 years, I don't remember hearing so much chatter about a war crime court. Um, so you believe it has to do with economic and political um, self-interest. Why now, though, and not 12 years ago or over the last... And, and, and of course, uh, thank you for asking that question. That is the million-dollar question. Madam Salif was in power for 12 years. 
she of course at some point supported the war. All the people that are going up and down now calling for war crime trial, where have they been? I guess they have been sleeping and they didn't talk. They were busy doing uh, something different. And what happened here is that we had an election. I know Prince Johnson is considered to be the godfather of Nimba's politics. He won election, just barely won election. And maybe other, war, people, other people associated with the war won election. So as a result, a lot of people are angry. Why should Prince Johnson be elected? Why should this person be elected? Why should that person be elected? You know, maybe the best thing we can do is to prosecute them instead of giving them the opportunity to, to run for an elected office. You know, so as a result, there is a frenzy of activities right now calling for war crime to me by people who have failed to win election in the country. Maybe the best thing they could have done during the election, maybe they could have formed some kind of political party around this agenda of calling for war crime or saying let's discourage the participation of anyone associated with the war. They didn't do it. So if someone like Prince Johnson wins election and people elected him, should we use that as a basis for a war crime trial? No, I don't think so. If just Bole won election based on his rapport with his people in Grand County, I don't think that should be a reason for war crime. You know, what should be what we should be focusing on is why the people are electing these people. Maybe they said something to the people that people find more interesting, people can uh, uh, can relate better to than some of the other candidates. So if you your motivation for calling for war crime is because of politics or because you want to eliminate your opponent, one way or the other, I think that is wrong. That's hypocritical. So, uh, Mr. Conner, one reason for those in favor of war crime is to serve as a deterrent. Because uh, if nothing is done, another person will have the incentive to go and wage war again. What do you say to that argument? No, I don't think war crime trial is an it is a deterrence to war. What is the deterrence to war? It's a full-fledged democratic practice that we have right now. Uh, democracy is not built in one day time. Democracy is a gradual process. We've had 12 years of peace on Madame Saleh. What we need to do is to consolidate that peace, that democratic value, make sure the democratic value is taught in our school, is taught in our villages, we should have dialogue among our people at village level, at town level, at city level, at national level to make them to understand the benefit of peace and reconciliation and how progressive the country can be in terms of development and progress as a result of peace, sustainable peace. That's what we need to be doing now. Because let's say today you have a war crime trial and tomorrow you have another dictator that will begin to curtail our democratic franchise, our de democratic freedom, then of course you're going to have people that resist. You know, once people know they're supposed to be free, once people know that uh, they have the freedom to live in peace and security, and you have the government in power that want to, you know, do something to curtail that freedom, they're going to resist. Resistance to dictatorship is natural tendency on the part of every human being. You know, uh, so to me, the best deterrence to war is to make sure that we maintain the democratic process we have there. And I think Liberian people have learned enough. I'm not sure any leader is going to be stupid or crazy enough to say he's going to come and impose some kind of dictatorship on Liberian people. That would be something that would be resisted by everyone. You know, from Samuel Doe, we, he, I mean, we all know how Samuel Doe ended up how Tobo ended up, and how Taylor ended up. So do you think you're going to have a copycat dictator that will come in Liberia that Liberian people are, will, will have no option but to resist, to carry on war, to remove that person? I don't think so. You know, once you have introduced people to the democratic process, all we have to do is to continue to consolidate that gains of 12 years. Not too long. I, I, I think in uh, some years ago when I was in Liberia, 
we celebrated 12 years of peace. I mean, let's say 10 years of peace. Yeah, we celebrated 10 years of peace. Then by the time we had a large transition from Madame Salif to just where, we're talking about celebrating 12 years of peace. And of course, it means that incrementally, democratic process is beginning to take hold in our society. Because some of the um, example of democratic process and democratic value is regular election, where representatives, senators, presidents, people, people have the freedom to compete for the leadership at any level, and it is left for the people to say whether this is the person they want or that is the person they want. So I believe what we have right now is a deterrence to another civil crisis if we're meeting that democratic process. But if you set up a war crime trial, it's not a deterrent. Because as long as some group feel that their right is being violated, they can rise up any time to do something, you know? And there's so many ways people can show that there's pleasure over injustice done to them. It could happen through peaceful demonstration. It could happen through armed violence. It could happen through the different processes. So for people to just say that uh, war crime trial is the deterrence to further war in Liberia, I don't believe in that. I just but, believe that as we Mr. each other. Mr. Conner. Yeah. Yes. What's about the victims? The victims need justice, okay? If we say, okay, all we need now is democracy. As long as we have democracy, everything is fine. What's about the victims? We all are victims. Even some of the young people that are being arrested now and put in jail, they are victims. All right? Let's say, for example, uh, Mohammed. Mohamed Jabate, that was convicted quite recently here in Philadelphia on immigration charges. Of course, one can say that his conviction and the long sentence given him is because of the war in Liberia. You know, because under normal circumstances, if you are found guilty for immigration fraud in America, you're probably going to stay in jail for, you know, maybe three, four years, and they deport you back to your country. But you put a young man in jail for 30 years, that's because of what happened in Liberia. Because you have these guys that are campaigning for war crime trial. They have strong influence on the outcome of that situation. But, of course, you have to understand why Mohammed, as a young man, might have participated in the war. Mohammed also is a victim because Mohammed saw his parents, his family members, being killed. I'm sitting here. I'm victim of the war as well. I know I can name you more than 100 of my own extended family that were killed in the war. And not because of any other thing, but because of their ethnicity. You know? Right. So and that's exactly you know, what I'm saying. So those 100 family members, where is justice for them? Well, the, a, a, a lot of those people, the, the, the surviving family members, I'm not advocating for war crime. I'm not advocating for war crime. I believe that, well, uh, my people were killed during the war. And uh, as a result, some young people, some people from our community too, organized to fight a war. Because there was no way we were going to regain our self-respect, our dignity without a war. You know, yeah. we saw the war as the only option to, gain, to, to regain our self-respect in Liberia. I, I mean, I, I did not fight a war. You know, I was a civilian living throughout, but I know a lot of brothers and sisters that sacrificed their life to fight to bring justice to us. So for us, we don't see our brothers and sisters that, that fought in the world to, 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 to be bad people. We think that they have to do something that was just necessary, you know. And the fact of the matter here is war has been with human beings forever. The people we are running after right now, you know, like that, whether it's the American or the European to help us to provide money to persecute war. Look at the war they are sponsoring every day. Every single day, as we talk right now, they are sponsoring war somewhere. We haven't heard of them to setting up war crime trial, you know. And of course, like I said earlier, war is not a tea party. I used to be in the military. When you are a member of the military and you go to war, there's two things. You're either going to be killed or you're going to kill someone, you know? And they're all going to be victims of war. But I think we, the surviving family members of those that were victimized by the war, 
we can become more innovative and build strong society, economically viable society that will benefit everyone more than saying, let's go for a world crime trial where my brothers, my sisters, or your family members, one way or the other, will end up being put in prison. You know, my, my, my belief is that all of us are perpetrators of war in Liberia, and all of us contributed to the war one way or the other. So if, I, if, if, if you supported Mr. Taylor at some point in the war, you knew, you knew who were being killed by Mr. Taylor's forces through our Liberia. He didn't say anything about that. So for you to come out today and say, let's have a war crime trial, you ought to be, you, 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 you ought to be ignorant of what happened, or you've been very hypocritical. You know? So I think all of us are victims of the war, all of us are perpetrators in the war, and the best way forward is not to be hypocritical about it, it's for us to all come together and say to each other, sorry. Oh, um, well, Mr. Conner, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report um, recommendation does state that they want to provide amnesty for people who were below the age of 18 and were basically forced to fight or weren't old enough to really make a sound decision for themselves. That's one. And then two, the Reconciliation Commission, I guess, understands that there were a lot of people involved in the war, right? So they're not asking for every single person to be tried. They're asking for those involved to come forward and say, I'm sorry, and show remorse. And they are calling for the leaders of the warring faction to be tried. I guess, why are you opposed to that? Well, like I said, uh, I, just based on matter of principle, I have decided that at some point, Liberian people, not just the leader, leaders are not are, are just individual, but the people that support them. You know, like I said, the war was a popular movement among Liberian people. Nobody gave a damn whether Crown people were being killed. Nobody gave a damn whether Madingo people were being killed by the MPF soldiers. Nobody gave a damn about that. You know, I remember Morovia at that time when people used to say to some of us, you are 1990 citizen. You don't belong here. If you stay here, Mr. Taylor is going to do your business. People mm -hmm. used to say that to us. You know? So that's the first psychological trauma we went through. When your close friends who you went to school with will express their support for the war even though they knew your people were being killed. You were being selected based on your tribe, your religion. Your mosque were being desecrated everywhere. You know? From um, Nimba to bond everywhere NPFS soldiers went, they were doing, everybody knew what they were doing. But why is it we didn't see anybody resisting or anybody putting up protests against their indiscriminate killing of people based on tribe and religion? We didn't see that happening. So that's why it tells me that most people that are calling for a war crime trial today is either because, you know, of hypocrisy and, 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 and maybe because of the fact that at the time, they did not see the war to be something terrible. Their people were not being killed. So, of course, the war became an equal opportunity distributor of terror. You know, the Samuel Doe used to say, time trap is not for right alone. If you stood aside and start laughing at other people that they are dying, you're not dying, then when the violence travels to your side and something starts happening to you, then you can't say, now today, let's have a war crime trial. So, basically... I'm looking at the hypocrisy of the Liberian people in general. But Mr. You know? Conner, Mr. Conner, yeah. I know you are hurt by, by those things, but that shouldn't be an excuse for those who bear the greatest responsibility of the mayhem. That's the point. People were killed, yes, people said, and not everybody, I know people, including my father who was against the war. So there were people that were against the war. So to say, well, when they were killing Madingos you didn't, or Crown, you didn't say anything. So since they kill your people, that's it. There should be no punishment for those who bear the greatest responsibility. I don't think that's a strong position. 
Well, I mean, that, 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 that's your that's your position. If that, I mean, I respect that very well. But this mountain opposition, if you see me talking about let's prioritize reconciliation over war crime, that's what I'm saying it for. If you don't look at the root cause of the war, why the crime people have to be killed, why the guilty people have to be killed, why this group has to be killed, if you don't look at that to see how you can resolve that at, at the community level, how you can create a situation for inter-tribal dialogue so all these ethnic groups can basically you know look each other in the face and say look you know something terrible went on during the war and uh, I want you to forgive me and I'm willing to forgive you that to me is the best way forward all right if you just joining us this is focus on Liberia we are on our opposing viewpoints tonight our topic is the establishment of war crimes court in Liberia uh, we had an opportunity for someone who is for war crime court to appear, but he was not able to. We have Mr. Vasiki Kone, who is against the establishment of war crime court. So before I bring in uh, our callers and Facebook participants, I want to ask you, Mr. Kone, what format, because you are calling for reconciliation instead of war crime court, first of all, are the two incompatible? And secondly, what form do you want this reconciliation to take? Well, um, I think if I remember very well, uh, Madam Salif, when she was president, she set up a committee called, you know, Reconciliation Committee. Uh, that committee is supposed to create dialogue among various groups throughout the country to talk about the war and talk about the issue of forgiveness and the way forward. At one point, uh, I, I believe our current president, Mr. Weir, was the chairman of the committee that was supposed to reconcile the nation. Uh, I'm not sure whether I would say he failed or succeeded, but I know Madam Salib at some point said that she failed on the issue of reconciliation. Um, should we say, Mr. We have failed the Liberian people at that time, or should we say, we ever, I know after Mr. We are, uh, this, the, the, uh, one Torba, I can't remember the first name, was also appointed as chairman of the commission. And uh, if my memory can serve me well, uh, Ms. Lima Bowie served at some point as member, I mean, as chairman of the chair leader of the commission. All right. So I believe if we have to set up uh, the, the, the program for reconciliation, we have to revisit, you know, the, what, 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 what contributed to the resignation of Ms. Bowie, um, what were the successes and failures of President, I mean, Mr. Weir when he served as the chairman of the Reconciliation Commission, and the last gentleman, I, I, I know his last name is Turbo, maybe belongs to the Turbo family, we could also find out um, what was the, you know, the program objective of the commission, you know, and uh, the successes and failure, what were some of the challenges they faced. We can consult all of these people. But if I have to say something about, how does the reconciliation process going to take, I mean, uh, what form it should take? I would say it should be inter-tribal dialogue, you know, among various groups. Uh, I, I know if we refer to our African tradition, we're all African people, whether we're Christian or Muslim, but the fact of the matter is we're African people, and I believe that we have concrete resolution methodologies among our African tribes and our African tradition. So we should consult all of that to see what is the best way forward, you know. But I would just say overall we need inter-tribal dialogue among those that were fighting the war, those that were the four tribes and all the other tribes that were affected. Because if you look at Grand Cape Man, for example, and Lofa and maybe Bami, these are predominantly bad people and Muslim people. And you have the Limo there, NPFL there, they did a lot of things to, I mean, they, 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 they probably did a lot of things. I mean, they did a lot of things, and of course, you know, all of those people that are affected at different levels must be included in the process of national dialogue for national healing, national reconciliation, national peace. That's what I believe. 
Thank you. And uh, it's unfortunate that we don't have our uh, person for who is in favor of war crime court. The number to call will be posted uh, shortly so we can hear the side of those who support the establishment of war crime court. We want you to tell us how that is going to serve as a deterrent. Mr. Connor does not believe so. And uh, so please, uh, the number will be posted shortly so you can call in. Better still, you can post your comments on Facebook and we're going to read that. Yeah, and uh, let me say this too, you know, I know I got a lot of friends on the other side that are supporting war crime. My only problem with them is that they don't want to see a debate. The moment you oppose their view, they begin to characterize you as a, you are a supporter of killers. You are a criminal. To me, every issue in any society is subject to debate. If I'm saying I think the best option for us is to have, you know, restorative dialogue, restorative justice. I think my position should be respected as much as you would say, let's have a war crime trial. You know, we should begin to respect each other. I know quite a number of people, you, you've seen me clashing with some of them in the bureau chat room before. Uh, they are very, very emotional, and they make it look like some of us are so heartless. We don't give a damn. We don't care. Maybe you're not even a true Liberian raising call for something other than war crime trial. What I'm trying to say is that it's a national debate. It must be treated as such. So every one of us must exercise our right to agree or not to agree with anything as such. I mean, it's, uh, something like the war crime I mean, uh, dialogue, that, uh, debate as well. Oh. So someone like Loveda Tugbe, he, she, she said, I, I respect her very much in her advocacy, but she also must respect other people that hold contrary view to her. I've said that over and over, and I, and, and I believe that that message should be sent out at this time. Uh, for me to say I'm not for war crime trial, it doesn't mean I don't care about people that die. All of us care about our dead, you know. Regardless of which tribe, which religion you come from, we all care about the death in our family, in our society, in our community. So uh, I am remorseful and regretful of the fact that we lost 250,000 of our people. But we should have a permanent memorial in Liberia to remind us every day that these are our family members. These are our fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters that died in the war. There should be permanent memorial. I think uh, people from the Kwadubuni region, uh, in Lofa County, Kwadubuni Madingo region, in Lofa County, they have something like every year on, I think July 12th every year, they have a memorial program for the massacre that took place there. And I participated in that. Um, whenever I had the opportunity to be there, I participated in that program. And basically, I don't have, I, I'm not so heartless, or we are not so heartless, that we don't give a damn about what happened to our people. All of us lost somebody in the world. I'm not sure you can see any Liberian today that will tell you I didn't lose a single individual in the world. We all lost people. Like I said, my, I can name more than 100 family members that died in the war. Mm. So my saying let's have a peace and reconciliation doesn't mean I don't care about those people. I just want to make that point clear as well. Thank you. All right, Mr. Conner, that's a very fair point about uh, the argument concerning, you know, for and against the war crime court. Uh, most people who support war crime court either talk about the TRC recommendations or the ICC. But the TRC recommendations listed more things, I think 38 recommendations, the establishment of an extra criminal court for to prosecute war crime was just one of them. I too sometimes wonder why, you know, those other recommendations have not been talked about. Yeah, but maybe, like I said, war crime trial advocates are being more political. That's the reason they're not talking about all the other recommendations. If they are, if they are truly for peace and, I mean, peace and progress in Liberia, they shouldn't just be one-track-minded people, that you only focus on one thing. So if you're just saying that 
I've been read through the TRC document for a while now, uh, but it has long list of recommendations. So if people really, really want to see Liberia progress, they should not just be one track minded people who are focusing on one thing. Why are we not talking about all the other things that the TRC talk about? You know, I've read the TRC document. Uh, I, may not have, I may not have read it in its entirety, but I read some very good portion of it some time ago. You know, so it, it has a lot of great things. Like, like for example, I was just listening down something here, you know, uh, 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 Ms. Daniel was reading. She talked about monument. She talked about campaign education for those that were affected by the war, rehabilitation of former combatants. You know, and I think rehabilitation for former combatants would have been one of the best things, you know, because, like, these young people, they were not the ones that planned the war. They were so young. I was so I was young. I, I probably was not in my team, but I was not aware, aware of a lot of things in society to have made intelligent decisions at that time. But I'm just, I guess I'm blessed. I didn't take ball. I didn't fight. You know, I was one of those people that were running shelter skelter from Liberia to Guinea to Africa and back. Matter of fact, when I came back to Liberia, uh, there was no way I could travel through MPFA line because I would have been killed simply because of my ethnicity. So the only way we could come back to Morovia was through the boat. You know, those rickety boat, boats that used to be on the ocean, a lot of people used to drown, but we took the risk to come back to Morovia. When we, come, when we came back to Morovia, we experienced the octopus. You know, the octopus was a very, very challenging moment for us. I remember when MPFL, Almost overran Monrovia when Ekomo had to call on AFL and Yulimo to come to the rescue. So at that time, Yulimo was seen to be uh, a collaborating force for peace, for good in Liberia. They had to come help to repair, uh, to repair NPFL aggression on Monrovia. You know? So there's a lot of things we should be talking about. But when people are only motivated by politics and money, like I say, they are only going to be one track man that people focus on one thing on it. Because today, we all say, you know, how Liberia has to be running behind all other countries begging for money. But this war crime advocate, what are they doing? They're basically running after all these other people to provide money. Because we are talking about maybe $500 million. So you had to go all around the world to beg people to set it up. And I don't even see how it's going to happen. Because like I said, war crime trial history is a victim's justice. So if the government and the legislators, we have not done one, how is it going to happen? You got a bunch of civilians that are running around trying to convince the international community. You know, they're even advocating for international community to put sanction on Liberia. Because, you know, the current leadership is saying, hey, it's not timely. So are these people patriotic? Are they nationalistic indeed? That you have to go and talk to the international community to start giving assistance to your country because the, 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 leader, the current leadership is not doing what you want to do? These are some of the questions I have in my mind on this so-called war crime advocate campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, if you're just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. Very shortly, we will, uh, the number for you to call in will be posted. And for our guests to call in, we want to hear another viewpoint, especially that is in favor of war crime court. I know there are uh, some posting, but I want to hear, I want to see and read views that are contrary to what uh, Mr. Conner is espousing. So if you are there, please, uh, our guest relations manager, Mrs. Stephanie Cetro, is going to put the number shortly for you to call in and join the conversation. So, Mr. Connor, as we as we wait for our callers to 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 call in, you you have been in a in, in Liberia, yes. like, you've been there front and back. Mm -hmm. 
And right now you are arguing against the establishment of war crime code. What are you hearing from, from the people? Are you against what they want or what is, what is it that they, they, they are saying? Well, uh, I think, uh, you know, my, my position on war crime is not just now. Uh, I, have, I have been saying this as far back as 2005. I know people started murmuring about war crime. You know, they said TRC recommendation came out and said Madame Salib and 30 other politicians should have been banned from participating in politics. You know, I have said all along that the best way forward is for us to, you know, accept responsibility for what happened. All of us accept responsibility, you know. If you supported any warrant fashion, whatever that warrant fashion did, it did it in your name. You know, because like like I said, war is not a tea party. You know, so all we just have to do is to move forward. I've said that over and over. That has been my consistent position. I'm not a politician to say, look, you know, because of politics, I'm going to change my position for this. I'm not running for any public office. I've never run for public office before. Maybe the future, I don't know. But I don't have any intention of saying right now I'm going to run for a representative or a senator anywhere. So I'm free to say what I want to say. You know, without any political repressors from people that may want to support me or not want to support me. It's just a matter of principle that I'm seeing what I'm saying. You know, because a lot of times people position changes based on political interests. But at this particular moment, there's no political interest to make me change my position on this, something I have been talking about for the past 10 years. All right. Mr. Mr. Connor, we have a caller on the line. All right. Call out your name and where you're calling from. Then state your position. All right. We have Mr. Bakama M. Corner on the line. Mr. Yes, Corner. Thank you very much for putting me. Yes, sir. Yes. Thanks for tuning, joining. Yes. Your question or comment. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will, you want me to talk now? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm making a comment. I'm not giving the guest a question. Though. Okay, sir. All right. Uh, first of all, you know, as the as the, the guest of guest said that uh, you know we need this is a serious matter, and we all understand that. And uh, what happened in Liberia is a tragedy. It's a peaceful history that we all understand that. But it's not that somebody's protecting somebody from being prosecuted. If they live with me personally, you can arrest all the war law and those that committed crime in, in Liberia and put them in jail. I don't really care. But is that good for Liberia? That's what we need to look at. For me, I believe you get over 50,000 human beings that committed crime in Liberia. Even if you arrested, if you arrest like Kuma, you arrest Sekou Damati Kona, you arrest Job Bully. So you arrest all the war law and put them in jail. So the individual that went and killed my mother or that killed my father, was that, would that justify that for me? Or would, that, would, would, that, would that bring justice to me? No. The man still walking the street. We saw people that committed crime that were serving as a witness against their fellow. They went there and walked by there. You know, Jesus Amanda then, that arrested sent the queen, entire family and went executed the, the way he wanted. He was serving as the war crime witness, giving all the privilege. After that, he walked away free. They were protecting him. That's what I'm going to do. This man is the most dangerous man that I can ever imagine in Liberia. That Benjamin Yitain will give him order that he go and execute people. That people. A lot of people went to serve as a witness. That, that, that don't even have the moral character to go and serve as a witness against another criminal. Like a criminal say, okay, I can say something against criminal. My, man, my brother, let me tell you something. The Western propaganda for a war crime issue, I don't understand it. I'm not, this is not a justification. For do for crime that were committed in Liberia, for me, for us to we don't even know what we're signing for here. If this court is established in Liberia, if they tell you what how much one of those judges were made to go and sit down whole day and do whatever they want to do, saying that they are prosecuting somebody and prolong this period and do whatever they want to do, it it will bring a lot of problems that we don't want. And second to that, I believe. Instead of putting our time and energy, our precious time and energy behind those things, those that were affected by the war, my brothers and sisters, they are, they, they are struggling every day in Liberia. 
when I was in Liberia, there was a young man. He's on Center Street. This guy threw him that car off. It's a terrible situation. We used to buy food and take our time and feed these guys most of the day. Just be sorry for him. This guy, two hands are cut off. And some people are using crutches. Their legs are affected. They need medical attention. Some people need transportation. Some people need vocational training programs that will make them better people. So if we arrest all right and put them in jail, would that solve the problem for these people? No. For me, let's use our energy in positive programs. And those programs will be what? Education? Vocation, like a, which is vocational training programs and other stuff. They would provide medical attention to some people because some people need medical, medical attention for life because they were hit by bullets that are personal, that, that are personal. And those need medical attention. Those that need prostate legs, they create NGO, non-governmental organizations that will be associated with the government to be able to solicit for around the world, to be able to go through the process, the process. And the reconciliation process is a very fine point. We can see that as a brothers and sister and discuss our differences because you can't tell me that anybody in Liberia was not part and parcel of the war one way or the other, whether you were involved physically, financially, or by heart. That's how people do. When war fight in the country, people are going to die. So we're not going to say that we should prosecute everybody in Liberia. Prosecuting all this will be a waste of time for, for us. Yeah. Let's focus on the development of our country. Let's focus on disseminating information that will unite the Liberian people. As Brother Kone said, if in the same process, look, I want somebody to tell you, Topa, this guy is, this lady, she's not even living in Liberia. She's telling me, so Kone, that the male family people don't live in Liberia. Once you start going after somebody's family now, it becomes personal. This is not what we discuss here. I'm not, I don't have no discussion with Mr. Kone's family. Mr. Kone can't want to show. I can disagree with Mr. Kone, or me and Mr. Kone can agree on a point. So that's my point. I'm dealing with Mr. Kone. But if he started calling for somebody's family, I, I don't know this lady, but she and myself had a lot of conversation on discussing Liberia before. Her behavior is a trap behavior because if we started calling for Madingo people, we started calling for Gio people, we started calling for Mano people, this is a waste of time. I was born in Nima County, in a small town in Nima County, because Bree Valley is a Gio town. When my mom is going on the farm, she would just leave me in the hand of a Gio woman and just walk away and go on the farm. She can't nine o'clock in the night. You go to the woman's house. Oh, where, where, where the man here? Oh, you come to my husband in the night. Go to the old man and go sleep. The man was three years. That's how people used to live before. But when the war comes, when war comes, people disagree and things go out of control. When I, when I went from Morovia to this small town, when I left from Africa, I went like, bro, I went to this small town, somebody gave me a cry. They said, what? Why will you come doing a booth here? Everybody afraid to come here that something want to happen to them. So, you know, we all sit down, we lecture that day, we later we took our motorboat, we, we went. But my brother, we were brothers and sisters before. And I believe that brother can come back to that stage if we decide to listen to each other and understand each other and move in a positive direction. But if somebody feels that they can intimidate somebody in Liberia, that's not going to work. Everybody share blood for that country. So the fact of the matter, nobody going to take a down fast to allow somebody to come and tell them both crap and walk away free. No, that's not going to work. But the best thing we can do is to lower our voice to each other and understand each other and believe that we are all like doing and believe in change in the future. But if we keep believing in vision, it's a problem. So then move forward in one direction for better for Liberia. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your contribution. If you, they are number two, six seven eight two six three eight eight zero four. That's a, that was the voice of Mr. Bakama Kone, who is also not in support of a war crime court. And we want someone who is in favor of war crime court to please call. The number is six seven eight two six three eight eight zero four. Yeah, uh, the caller just mentioned certain things here, uh, saying that someone just wrote and said, either he doesn't have a family in Liberia, or I don't have a family there. We all have family in Liberia. I mean, it is impossible to bring all of our families from Liberia here. Uh, I talk to my brothers, my sisters every day in Liberia. Um, so for someone to be so insensitive, and to think that because we don't have family there, that's the reason we're saying what we're saying. I mean, that, that, that's just ignorant. You know, right. that's stupid. So, okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Connor, there's a question here for you from Mr. James Wisnat. He mm -hmm. said, my question to Mr. Connor is, if we must reconcile or forgive those warlords or criminals, should we also forgive those who commit crimes 
on a day-to-day -day basis in Liberia and are accounted for what they, what they did by serving their time in prison? What should we set as precedent or how we can proactively avoid this from happening again in our society? When there's difference between normal time and war time. Normal time, we expect law and order to be restored, law and order to be in progress. We expect people to be living peacefully. But when war comes, what that does is that it's a breakdown of law and order. So a lot of things happened during that time. It was a matter of survival. Like right. I said, I have nine years history of military in the U.S. I mean, I didn't, I didn't join military in Liberia, but here in America, I have nine years experience in the military. Mr. Mr. Connor, sorry to interrupt. We have another caller on the line. Okay. Call out your name and where you calling from. Okay. All right, we are still waiting for that color. Color, you on the line, please? And if you are in favor of war crime code and you don't, but uh, the, the phone is going off, please, or just post your, right. your position. We are still waiting for that color. Color, you on the line? So if you are in favor of war crime court, please post uh, why are you in favor? Uh, Mr. Michael Gilman, please try calling again. We are looking for people that are in favor of war crime court. Please uh, tell us why you want a war crime court why you think a war crime court is going to serve as a deterrent, why you think that Liberia's issues can be resolved if we have a war crime court right now in Liberia. Mr. Conan, some of the questions coming up from Facebook um, are bringing up the idea that in war, or your idea that in war, anything can happen. But I believe even within the U.S., when we're fighting, um, the goal is never to aim at civilians and women and children. Normally, the strategy is to go after the military or, like, areas where weapons are to destroy the enemy's weapons. Um, yeah. Okay. So what, what is our or what is your position on that? Yeah, you know, what I told you earlier, there's a difference between professional military. I used to be a member of a professional military, the U.S. Navy, all right? Yeah. That is that is different from when you have a situation we had in Liberia where you have a bunch of rebel organizations that are just recruiting people. These children are not undergoing any training, you know, I mean... They, 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 they could barely read. All they taught them was to shoot the guns. When we talk about professional military, it is not just the uh, infantry that is emphasized. You're talking about people learn trades. People tra learn trades in the military in America. So whether there's a war time or peace time, people have different, different activities to occupy themselves with on a daily basis. And even with that, when America was, when we were in Bosnia, or, I mean, yeah, Bosnia, you know, uh, going against philosophy, there was a time that the Chinese embassy, you know, was attacked. Or, well, I mean, I think, yeah, it was the Chinese embassy that was attacked during that time. 
And of course, it was considered to be collateral damage, you know, and that happens in war. And we are talking about professional military who are so careful as to not do harm to something they're not supposed to harm. No, that's why even the technology called precision, precision weapon came from. Where when a missile is fired, it is expected to go and hit the target. You understand? That's the professional military. What we had in Liberia was untrained young people that were conscripted into very warring fashion to fight a war. So you cannot, I don't think you can hold professional military at the same standard compared to uh, rector, you know, rebel forces. You can't compare the two. Mr. Connor, sorry to interrupt again. There's a caller on the line. All right. Call out your name and where you calling from. My name, my name is Saki Golasale, calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Saki, your questions, comments, or contribution? Yeah, I just want to make a comment to contribute to the show. And my position is uh, pro war war crimes court, and I uh, actually uh, it's something that we we all, as uh, Mr. Cummings said a couple of days ago, that we have to look at both sides. I mean, people who make the argument about uh, there should be no war crimes court and those on the other side. All views are important. Uh, me, I respect Mr. Cunning's view about war crimes court, and I am sure that uh, my view is also should be respected. But when we look at it uh, on the scale, I think uh, uh, peace is all what we want at the end of the day. And whether you like it or not, peace doesn't come easily. I mean, it's something that is costly. All right. And in order to prevent future problems of 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 our lawlessness and chaos and anarchy, we have to pursue justice because our within justice lays peace. Once we seek justice, it means that we are moving towards peace. And I think the war crimes court, regardless of who is uh called to uh to the court who is sent to jail, is going to set as a president. I mean, a common example, people are very bitter in Liberia. The bitterness uh, is buried in a lot of people, and every more opportunity people have, you will get that feeling of the bitterness. One typical example of how people are still bitter, I will give it to you this. Recently, you listen to, you watch a video where the deputy minister, uh, Mr. Eugene Sangam, in his emotional outburst, you listen to what he said, some of the things that came out of the minister's mouth. They were real, things that were buried in him. I mean, about uh, Representative Snow involvement in the war and killing and his alliance with Taylor and, you know, just name it. That thing that came out of him is buried in a lot of people moving around daily. And they see their perpetrators parading the streets, enjoying state resources. They just got those things buried. The little uh, chance you give people to express their anger, you're going to hear the most disgusting things about their opponents. And those things are real. That's the society we have today. People have the anger buried in them. <laughs> Give them a little chance. They're going to come up with it. So I think justice or, or retributive justice is the only phrase, is the only thing that can bring sanity and lead us to a prosperous and peaceful country. People have to account for the wrong they did to us. I mean, generations were led you know, to nothing. So there's some of us who have had our own family, 
All right? I'm a victim of the war. Okay, I don't feel happy. My perpetrators, those who cause uh, uh, suffering for me, keep uh, 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 moving around and free, you know. And the, the most disheartening thing about it, you don't see the perpetrators involved in an act of peacemaking. They feel so pompous. They feel so entitled to life than other people who were killed. It is the victims who have been on the front line trying to bring sanity to the country. So we definitely need a war crimes court to bring this whole matter to rest so that we can move this country to peace and Mr. serve as a deterrent for other, other troublemakers in the future. Mr. Mr. Golafale, the, the question has been, yes. say, say we have five, even ten warlords or people that bear the yes. If we even get them and take them to the gallows, right? What is it going to yes. do? Is it going to stop and never will be war, war criminal from waging war? Or is it going to stop another one during war from raping and pillaging the villages? Is that what is it? Is that what it's going to do? It's going to serve as a deterrent. Nobody's going to sit tomorrow and say, "Our uh, Mr. X Y Z killed people and went free, so I can do mine. I can remove a government. I can sponsor war and do anything." But there is a penalty at the end of the day. It's simply. If you cross the red light, if you're driving and the police is around, you cross the red light, of course you might be given a ticket depending on the magnitude of it. If you're over speeding in a, in a, in a non speedy zoom, in a, in a, the police is going to issue you a ticket. And everyone who knows about the ticket issue, you know, it serves as a deterrent. So but people still, have to know. That, but still, that doesn't stop anyone from running it. So I'm still breaking traffic rules, though. We still have raping. Of course, it doesn't. It doesn't. But it, it doesn't. It doesn't stop people. But it will make you aware that indeed, at the end of the day, you gonna be people gonna come after you to account for what you did. All right. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Connor. That's uh, from Mr. Saki Golafale. Well, I, I respect Mr. Asaki Gurafali's opinion. Like I said, I respect everyone regardless of whether we agree or not on this issue. Uh, I treat it as a national debate. And at the end of the day, it must be Labran people to decide which direction they want. For people to be going around lobbying with international organizations, lobbying with international government outside of Liberia, to have a war crime trial in Liberia, I think that's new colonialist mentality. You know, I said to say we are not capable of doing anything on our own. We have to run behind our former colonial masters to do everything for us. If we expect our development agenda to be driven by ourselves, why can't we have a national dialogue and see what to do? Like I said earlier, the next election is coming. I don't know if it's a senatorial election, a general election. We can embed this whole debate on the ballot. Let the people determine what they want. So let it be Liberian people own desire to say whether they want peace and reconciliation or they want war crime trial. But I'm not interested. A uh, handful of people just running around lobbying for the international community concept of war crime trial. That's not too neocolonialistic to me. I disagree uh, with that. All right. We have another caller on the line. We have another caller on the line. Caller, your name and where are you calling from? Uh, Amos George, I'm going from Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, Mr. George, your question, comments, or contribution, please. Okay, I got, okay. Uh, let me say something. Uh, uh, I think you're getting a scene, uh, people, I'm for war crime, or uh, code and economic crime, code in Liberia. Let me, let me make that clear. Okay. And but I, I want to remind him, mm -hmm. I, come, I want to remind him, when uh, Representative Akaya Gray of the CDC now, Collected 10,000 signatures 
and took her to the House of Representatives for war crime court in Liberia at the time. He did not succeed. But much more to also put her to on the floor of the Liberian or the House of Representatives yelling. But there was a reason because Ellen name is mentioned in the TRC and she was president. There's no way Ellen would have accepted a war crime court in Liberia and economic court in Liberia. No way. But let me move forward. These people today who are against those who are against war crime court today send a new and for all the things in the TRC report, they're talking about reparation. They're talking about our horse. Why? They did not tell the king's men who committed the atrocity against the Liberian people to initiate this. They never told the king's men once. They never. Now, why would you sit down? This is the time. One. What happened to the Lutheran massacre? What happened to the GSA massacre? What happened to the UN compound? The Kadakian massacre, the Dupo rule. Every war has rules of engagement. What a ragtime military or what kind of military the UN. Pastor Jarrell, did you guys shower? Yes. Yes, a rule of engagement. To respect the, law, the rules for surveillance and those who are harmless. Let me ask this man. I got the point. My dinner people were killed. Quran people were killed. Your people were killed. All the 16 ethnic groups like that were killed. But let me ask him, because one group of people were killed, is that gave that group the right or any other group in Liberia to carry out a collective punishment against a group of other Liberians? Thank you. No, it doesn't. But let me tell you, so those who think that they will back the king's name now the days are over, Everybody, they're not seeing everybody. The TLC were clear. Children who were 18 or so, they cleared them. But we are talking about people who funded the war, who commanded this war. That is the military rule. The commanders, the general, those who funded this war, those are the people we are going after. If you people want that peace under the power of why are they not initiated ever since? You are now when we are coming out to press forward, now you tell them we are, it, it, it is politically motivated. Oh, man, that's your view. But we will not relent. So mm -hmm. all our commanders, leaders, they have to face the way. Freedom is what we want to say. It happened in Bosnia. It happened in former Yugoslavia, Germany, uh, Rwanda, South Africa, Africa. Liberia is no exception. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Judge. Mr. Connor, before you answer, I think we have another caller on the line. Okay. But, but but go ahead briefly to uh, Mr. George's point. Well, uh, I just listened to Mr. George, and I can see he's very, very emotional. You know, uh, like I said, uh, I'm a former military man. When I went through my basic training here in the U.S. Navy, we were taught about all of the things relating to Geneva Convention. You know, what to do, what not to do in terms of military engagement. But what we had in Liberia, these young people didn't have the opportunity. I had over here to sit in classrooms where well learned teacher, I mean professors taught me about different different situations regarding military engagement. These children didn't have that opportunity. It was a wartime and um you know and you know how excited young people will be when it comes to how do I mean discharging of weapons? I know when I served in the military here on a daily basis, if you serve in security duty, they count the number of, of bullets and gave it to you, and you have to account for it at the end of the day. These children didn't have the opportunity, and uh, you know basically what I'm trying to say is that. We all supported the war at some point, not just Bakingo people, not just Geo people, you know. But during the day of Octopus, I mean, when I lived in Morovia, on the day Yilimo made some gains, the city would be so quiet. When Taylor made any game militarily, the city would be laughing, you know. So you could say, 
I wish I could see someone at that time that was standing up to say no to war, that were demonstrating, that were talking here and there. Then if I could see that person today, I would believe in you. I would say you are sincere. But all those times when you didn't say anything, we had an opportunity in 1997. We could have right. rejected the war law. We could have said the war law should not participate in the election. But we gladly went out there and said, you killed my pa, you killed my ma, I'm going to vote for you. All right. So what that war law had done the right thing that Kwaki Gami had done in, in Rwanda. We were now going to be talking about war crime trial today. We'll be talking about having conversation to move forward simply because the choice we made in 1997, it was wrong. All the person that benefited from that choice made the wrong choices. You can't say as a result of that, let's have this and that. It mat what matters to me a lot is consistency. You can't just be Johnny Khan lately jumping into the fray today talking about war crime trial when he didn't say that yesterday, man. That's All what right. we got to talk about. Mr. Mr. Connor, another caller is on the line. Yes. And that color, I believe, is Stanley. Okay, we lost we lost that color. That was Stanley C1, and so we wait for Stanley to call back in. If you still just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing pro and cons of the war crimes court or the establishment of the war crimes court in Liberia. So we have a few more minutes before we draw down our curtains on this very important subject. So the number to call again is 678-263-8804 is a busy line. So if you have your comments, you can also post your comments right here on Facebook and our guests will respond. We are looking for more people who are in favor of the establishment of war crime court to tell us why they believe the establishment of WCC is going to help the country. Uh, Mr. Connor, one of the questions coming from Facebook I see over and over again is um, how do we set the precedent that what happened was not okay and that if you try it again, um, there are consequences? Well, um, I think, uh, like, like we just said earlier, a whole lot of recommendations were made, not just about war crime. We talk about monument. I would say just just be a national monument that should be like here in the U.S. where you have the Korea monument, the Vietnam memorial. You know, like it's here in Philadelphia and different parts. Like those that went to war in Korea, in Japan, other places. From here, there's a memorial for them. Same thing in. Um, in Washington, D.C., and like I say, you know, a, a friend, I mean, a literary fellow, I mean, a friend of mine, you know, luckily in Yamala, I saw some of the Facebook posts yesterday in Rwanda capital, Kigali, where there's a memorial for uh, those that died in the genocide of Rwanda, you know. We can have similar things in Liberia, national monument that should be listing you know, that should list the names of people that die. That should also happen in our towns and in the cities across Liberia. So every day when we pass the monument, it should, remind us, it should remind us of the terrible time we passed through. All right? And I care so much about these young people that were conscripted into these very worrying fashions. If I have my will, I will want these young people to be rehabilitated so they can become useful citizens. They can contribute to our society. Simply because you did something wrong doesn't mean it can be repaired. Right. You know, we all know that the U.S. prison system, there's a lot of people that want to jail, they still come out and become useful citizens. You know, one of my heroes, Alhaj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. We all know why Malcolm X did 
before he went to prison. He came out of prison as a reformed person. So that is the purpose of prison, to make bad people a better people when they come out of prison. You know? So I think our young people, instead of, you know, um, demonizing them so much, we should all contribute to making them better citizens through education, through vocational training. That's what I think we need to focus on. And, um, you know, um, let me say some of the points you said here today. Uh, yeah, I think education, um, sustainable agricultural program, anything that will make people better useful citizens to society, I will support that. But mainly the monument will be something very, very great to remind us every day that we did terrible things to each other in the past. And let's not repeat it. Good. Yes, so comments on Facebook from Elder Joseph Y. Kokro. It's a few questions for you, Mr. Kone. Yes. And uh, we have like 10 minutes to go in this uh, broadcast. Yes. Uh, so Ms. Luveta Tukba is on the line shortly. So as soon as Luveta calls in, we're going to be linking Luveta to you. Yeah, uh, I'll be glad to hear from Luveta Tukba. You know, she's one of those that I think that I'm heartless. I'm Wait so now, let me let me read from Mr. Kokro, Kokro. He said, <laughs> are you prepared to submit that all tribal groups, I like to use the word ethnic, that all, all ethnic groups in one way or the other committed war crimes during our war? Do you like some hold the belief that rules on the conduct of war do not apply to those purporting to defend themselves. But let me let me let allow the caller on the line before you respond to uh, Mr. Kokro's comment. Hello, Mr. Dennis Ja. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Your name and where are you calling from? Wonderful. Wonderful. This is Lavetta Tube from the Coalition for Justice. I first and foremost want to apologize to your listening audience because I know one of our team members, Mr. Goa, was supposed to be on the show tonight. We had confidence that he was going to represent the cause, but because of technical issues, he was able to come on tonight. He was unable to come on tonight. But I hope that you will consider him in the near future to come back to the show to be able to give positions on our cause for justice, why we are calling for justice. I've been listening to Mr. Conant's argument on why the, uh, the court is not necessary in Liberia. And I just wanted to add my voice. Okay. Why we are promoting and advocating for justice for the Liberian people. Why it is necessary to end impunity in the country because of what happened during for the 14 year civil war. In 2003, there was a peace agreement between warlords. It was warlords among themselves negotiating. The only way they could stop killing is they were giving government positions. So for the international community, for the sake of peace, to stop the senseless killing of innocent people, they struck a deal with those warlords. But within that agreement, there was a TRC recommendation, which it gave birth to the TRC which the uh, uh, transitional government enacted into law, giving power to the TRC commissioner to investigate the war. What was the cause of the war? Of course, we talk about marginalization. We talk about the injustices that were melted against Liberians, whether it was based on tribe or if it was based on politics. The land dispute so from 1979 to so to, to 2003 was the, was the time they were given to investigate. And they were given power to make recommendations. Recommendations for national unity, peace, and reconciliation. But when the report came in, on Okay, Ms. Tupa, we're losing you. All right. 
that was the voice of uh, Ms. Lovetta Tuba, that's the leader of the Coalition for Justice, one of the group that has been calling for the uh, implementation of the TRC, and also that has been very forceful lately calling for the uh, implementation or the establishment of a war crime court. My question to Lovetta was, you know, what's going to be, as she listed, was uh, there were other recommendations, okay, that were listed by the uh, TRC, <coughs> and there were reasons for the war, things that pre for which we fought, including what she listed as marginalization, corruption, and all the list that went on. How is TRC going to resolve, or no, how is the establishment of a war crime court going to resolve the issue of marginalization, the issue of corruption, the issue of, um, they talk about national symbols and all the things that the TRC document speaks of. How is the issue or establishing a war crime code going to resolve that? But uh, Lovetta is calling by shortly to uh, complete her thought. All right. Uh, I, I respect Lovetta's position very much, though I disagree with it. My only problem with Lovetta, like I said earlier, she and her colleagues think less of us. Maybe they think that we are beast. They think that we are so inhuman. Uh, in, in hmm. hmm. All right. Um, I'm having problem here, Dennis. My battery is running out. I oh, don't okay. know if we... Uh, but just one hour. All right. You said it should be over in 10 minutes, right? Yeah, in 10 minutes we should be over. All right, all right. So, you know, like, like I was saying, I respect her position. Okay, um, let, let, let her complete her thought and then we can uh, we can hear from you. Lavetta, if, if you're there. I apologize. I heard I was breaking up. Am I breaking up now? Yeah, please go ahead. You, you are very clear. Yes, uh, your point oh. quickly. Okay, my phone got disconnected, so I apologize. I don't know where I left off, but I know I was talking about the TRC recommendations and what was in, t in that recommendation to help to move the country forward. Right. You know, it is not a perfect document, but there were good things in that document to help to heal the wounds and to push the nation ahead. One that attracted some of us. Let's say you want recommendations and this war, these warlords claim that their fight was to eliminate Samuel Doe because of his, you know, human rights records. Samuel Doe was murdered in 2000, in 1990, but this war continued till 2003. Right. So what was the purpose of the war? If you were coming to liberate Liberian from dictatorship. So those are questions that I want Mr. Collins to answer. Doe were killed in 1990. The war ended in 2003. Please answer that question. Number, the second thing I want to emphasize on is the recommendation for, that was in the TRC report. One that talked about rehabilitation of child soldiers. No, I do not agree that all Liberians supported war in the country because we live in that country. I lived in that country. As an 11 years old, I have to run for my life. And it's by his grace that I'm here with you in America. So, no, I disagree with that. I think it's misinformation that is being promoted by those who want to find reason to justify the killings of innocent civilians, including Americans, okay. announced that died in that war trying to save lives. Okay. The main recommendation for rehabilitation of those child soldiers, okay. the war laws, Mr. Tupa, before yes. you continue, while you were away, what I was saying is uh, the things that caused the war, including that you alluded to earlier, is a marginalization and several other things that give rise to the war. How does the establishment of a war crime court correct these things, including marginalization, including corruption, including or, or part of our capitalism? <laughs> so why is it the emphasis is on war crime court instead of the rest of the TRC recommendations? Well, I think <laughs> because of the resistance by the very people that perpetrate a war, it, you, but we advocate for the four implementations of the TRC is part of our advocacy, the TRC four implementation, because it addresses reparation. 
It addresses the issues of, you know, inequalities in the country. And, you know, it addresses the issues for victims to get help. Recommendation as free education, free medical services. All of those things were squashed by these people that came to power because they didn't see the, the report as important because their names were implicated. So if you were genuine about reconciliation, you would have invested for the 12 years that you were in power. You would have invested in, invested in the people who lives you destroyed, who family you killed. You did not do that during the 12 years. Instead, you spent time massively looting the country and subjecting the victims to inhumane conditions in that country. To where people are saying enough is enough, that they do not want warlord democracy, where a warlord gets to decide their fate. And justice is, is important because it will bring about lasting peace. Because if we do not correct the mistake of the past, it is doomed to repeat itself. For us in the struggle, we want justice because the Constitution says so because the international treaty that Liberia signed says so, and it has to be implemented. And because of the political uh, propaganda around the TRC, our campaign has gone to a different level to go before the global community to say this, these are the issues. And of course, July 26, uh, 2018, the government of Liberia were giving a mandate to ensure that victims get justice and reparation in Liberia. So we're no longer, it's, no, it's not just the TRC, but now you have UN recommendation. And we are have to July 26, 2020, to address those issues. He campaigned since 2004 for war crime court. So when Conan sits here and talk about, oh, the war crime court is for political interest, was we are advocating for war crime court because of political interest? Because I do have records of him demanding war crime court. There are records of all of the partisans of the CDC demanding implementations of the TRC. I believe if this leadership means well, they will do what is right in the interest of the nation so that this country can move forward. Thank, thank, thank you, Ms. Ms. And, uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to draw down our curtains. And so, Mr. O'Connor, I want you to uh, wrap it up by responding to first Ms. Tugwe and then your final comments. All right. Uh, like I said earlier, the uh, better Tugwe and I have argued over and over and over on this issue. And the question she asked that the war and the, no, let's say Mr. Doe was killed in 1990, why the war continued up to 2003? If you check on my Facebook page today, my posting of today was the reposting of something I did some years ago, talking about how I was excited in 1990, thinking that the war was over when Samuel Doe was killed, but that the war continued for more than 10 years, until 2003. So I believe that if she reads that article that, article that I posted today on my Facebook page, she will find her answer there, you know. And like you said, um, Ms. Levita too bad. Of course, you talk about a whole lot of other things now that are recommended by TRC or were recommended by TRC. Their overriding concern has been the war crime trial. Why is it if you're interested in other aspects of the TRC project, why are you only focusing on one thing and one thing only? You only mention all these things here right now because you're being asked questions by the moderator of this program, but all in law, you don't talk about all the other things. You only talk about one thing and one thing only. That's my problem with that. She and her colleagues on that campaign. Your final comments as we wrap up. Well, my final comment here would be like, you know, it's like uh, we, we need to teach the, uh, the idea of peace and tolerance and reconciliation in our country. We need dialogue in our towns, cities, and villages throughout Liberia, among our tribal people. We need to do a video documentary about the importing, the dangers of war, the terrible nature of war, and what we need in Liberia. So we can take those educational materials to our classrooms to teach people about togetherness, to teach people about the benefit of living together in peace. You know, 
a few years ago, I went to Liberia to do a documentary on ethnic and cultural diversity. Okay, that documentary can be accessed on YouTube. That is my own individual effort to see how we can bring our people together, how we can bring dialogue among our people for common understanding so that we all can work together for society's upliftment. You know, I'm not just someone that talk. I've invested my own time, energy, and resources in my own way, in reaching out to people, in villages, in my county. Like when I go to Liberia all the time, I, I just don't stay in Morovia. I go to Saklipi, where I was born and raised. I go to Tengben. I go to Teto. My way of doing that is to say, look, you know, something happened uh, in the past during the war. Let's move forward. Let's build new life. And uh, I, I will encourage every one of you to just go on YouTube and see my documentary on ethnic and cultural diversity. And uh, my work as a writer, as a poet, I've always emphasized peace and reconciliation. Like my current book, uh, it's called The Love of Liberty Brought Us Together. Every poem in there talk about the past, talk about the painful experience, talk about, you know, uh, the, 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 the way forward as a people. So obviously, I am not insensitive to what happened to Liberian people. I've just been an advocate for peace. I've just been an advocate for peace and reconciliation. That is going to be what I will stand for. I've, I've, I've said that through all my writing. I've written three books. If you read my books, you're going to see that I'm standing for what, I'm stand, what I've stood for all these many years. I'm not just a journey come, journey come lately to this position. I've said it over and over, and it's manifested in all of my writing. So I will continue to say that even if my position is defeated by the Veda Tugba and other people, that would be fine, but I'm going to maintain my position on matter of principles. And uh, to just end this program, I wish to say thank you to you and your staff for giving me the opportunity tonight to come on your show to at least express a contrary view to what is popularly being accepted by some Liberian now, you know. It, it, it's like a, if you don't belong to A, you're not good human being indeed. But for me to have the opportunity to come on your show to say what I feel is really great, and I thank you guys so much. And um, it's a continued dialogue. We look forward to what other people have to say in the future for now onward. And thank you. God bless you. And I hope to appear here another time. God thank bless. You. Daniel? Yes, well, um, thank you, Mr. Connor, for joining us. Um, I know your opinion or your view is um, not a popular one at this time, so I just want to tell you thank you for being, being brave enough to step forward and share your view with us. Um, and my final thoughts on this is that whichever route we go, you know, we just want a stable and continued peace in Liberia. Um, and we do want a reconciliation, whether it comes, you know, from Palawa Hut discussions or whether it's from a war crime court. Um, and I do want to echo Mr. Cunningham's sentiment that in this discussion, while we have this dialogue, we must be respectful of one another's views. Um, I think when um, we try to get people on our side by using, you know, such incendiary language, we are touching on doing what people did in the past, you know, creating divides um, between us that push us to things like war. Um, so I just encourage everyone to respect each other in this debate and to stay away from incendiary um, comments. Um, you can strive towards your goal, whether it's for, like I said, Palava Hut discussions or, um, or the war crimes court. But uh, let's just do so peacefully and, um, and legally. <laughs> Once again, our viewers across the globe want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, we're going to uh, divert, digress a little bit and talk about the Liberian entertainment industry. 
the week after, we're going to continue our series on the opposing viewpoints, and our topic will be those for and against dual citizenship. Please be sure to tune in. Once again, I want to say thank you to Mr. Conner for joining. Thanks to our co-host. I want to say thank to our guest relations manager, the person who works behind the curtains to see what you see here, Mrs. Stephanie Cetro. We want to appreciate you so much. We thank all those, our contributors, and everybody who has participated in the discussion. Once again, we say thank you and good night. All right. Are you?